Welcome to our Tuesday night talk. <clears throat> and our speaker this evening is Harsha Pali. He is a resident brother at our uh, San Francisco Center. He just recently came back from India uh, a couple of weeks ago and um, he had uh, quarantine at our retreat center, which I'm sure he enjoyed. Um, um, and tonight's topic is very interesting. Do, do you all know that tonight's topic? No. <laughs> um, you know, uh, tonight's topic is identity theft. Identity theft. So I can't think of a better person than this is a very provocative title because what identity is being referred and was it stolen or did I like let it go, you know? So identity theft and Brother Harsh is very experienced. He's been a teacher and a resident yogi since 2000, so for 20 years. Um, his expertise is in software, being a software engineer, and um, he gives wonderful classes. So, uh, Brother Harsha, welcome. Om Shanti. Good evening, everyone. Welcome, welcome to the Tuesday talk. So, so Sarah, is this the first time uh, you're here? Were you been here before? I've been here before. Welcome, welcome. I, I love it. I'm totally addicted. <laughs> I come okay. twice a week now. Beautiful. What is that topic that you joined? Before? Yeah. Other than... Uh, um, fear was the last one, and um, I don't recall. I think this is my fourth one. Mm. They all blend in together because regardless of what we call it, it relates to so much more, you know? Yeah. It's very true, very true. Mm. And today's topic is also pretty much on the similar lines. And uh, so we have... Uh, Teju. Om Shanti. Om Shanti. Feel free to turn on your cameras. This is a small intimate gathering. Mm -hmm. So is it the first time, Teju? Uh, yeah, I attended the fear class too, and I've just finished the basic Raj Yoga class with Sister Elizabeth. So I'm I'm getting hooked on to like to all the knowledge that I get and you know what I can apply to my life and you know, just learning, starting out sort of. Beautiful, welcome, welcome. Sarah, you, you have tried the meditation course? Yes. Good, good, so, so. Oh, the, no, the course, sorry, no. I, I, I used to meditate like 20 years ago, mm -hmm. and so I'm coming back to it. Oh, welcome back, welcome back. Raj Yoga, the special uh, meditation course, so wherein we go a little uh, uh, details, detail on um, uh, how to meditate and uh, especially uh, uh, it is not a one fit for all uh, solution, uh, but there is a framework that we use that will help us to dive deeper. And that is uh, what we address in, in the initial course. And we have with us Tim, welcome Tim. So good to see you. So, so on the topic of identity theft, uh, um, it's, a, it's a deep topic in a way. And uh, if you look at the external version of identity theft, uh, um, especially in the cyber world right now, it is very easy to lose that identity, right? And that is why they say like, uh, don't share your, uh, uh, key 
uh, key identity information, especially like uh, uh, your SSN and uh, driving license and uh, social sec uh, social security number along with that is uh, um, address and things like that based on which somebody can create a bank account and then uh, take loans and, uh, and then they can do a lot of other damages to us, right? So, and then we have seen uh, there is a lot of uh, other services to protect your identity from being uh, lost, right? And then there is services for everything right now. But uh, today we will go a little deeper than the identity theft. So you might have seen this movie called uh, Born Identity, I think. Uh, so it is more about somebody gets into an accident and then they lose who they are or, or somebody who has uh, uh, put on too many masks and then they forget uh, who they really are, which is the mask or where is the identity sense of self lost in, in the mask that we keep changing day in and day out, right? So, and especially when we talk about uh, uh, um, uh, California, what comes to the mind is uh, IT Hub and other one is Hollywood. Right? In Hollywood, uh, that, that is what people mostly say that uh, in Hollywood, the big part the the big challenge that we face is uh, especially when they are playing a role uh, they get so absorbed into the character right and uh, some of the movies the the mm, move, uh, the characters that are played by some of the actors they start preparing themselves they put themselves in that situation so that they get to understand the mindset of the character right and uh, as they go through, I mean, they physically don't not only put them into those kind of situations, but also they get so absorbed in the, in the type of thinking of the character. And when they are playing, they live up to the character, right? And, and generally movie shooting does not just stop by, stop in day or two, but it goes on for almost a year for some of the movies to, uh, to produce and all throughout they're so absorbed for one year somebody is so much absorbed into a character and then they start identifying with that and then they start living up to it it's not only that but uh, as we go further we start and people also start looking looking up to you with the perspective of the role that you have played in that movie and that feedback that is coming back to you that reinforces the role that you the mask that we are holding on to right and they expect you to behave like that they expect you to speak in that terms right people identify you with the role that you have played out there and once you get so lost into it when the new role new character comes or some other some when the attention moves on to some other person, then you slowly start losing uh, uh, that identity altogether because you're not playing that role anymore and people are not giving that much recognition to uh, the role that you have played because there is a lot of other roles coming up, a lot of other movies coming up, a lot of other characters coming up because they are new, they're more flashy, they are more... Uh, intimate right so when you start identifying uh, when the when the attention of all the people start moving away from you you slowly start losing your sense of self and that is what hits a lot like people go into this uh, depressions and they go into is this all life is all about and things like that right so to some extent, it is not just uh, for the Hollywood actors, it is all for every one of us to some degree or the other. If we start looking at the big picture, right? This is a fundamental question everyone asks. 
either in the path of Buddhism or in most of the spiritual journey that they endeavor, right? That what is the ultimate truth? Ultimate truth, they say, is the death. Ultimate truth is the death, right? When everyone, everyone on this earth who, who are existing on this earth has to live one day, right? So everyone has a beginning too, right? So when we start, when we end, what is happening before, what is happening after, once we bring our attention to that, uh, transition, it brings our attention to the, it gives some, some clues to the solution of who I really am. Right? So am I the one only who exists in this physical realm? In this physical realm, as we go through these different phases, we start taking up, picking up different roles as if you are playing different characters on this stage, on this on the stage where different people try to identify you with different uh, roles. So when you're born, you're born as a child. So the minute you're born, you picked up a role as a child. Your mother, the, your mother will look, at, look up to you as a child forever. Forever meaning as long as you're in this, in, in this body, right? Same thing with your father, right? And your siblings will always look up to you as your sister or your brother, right? So you picked up a role and then immediately you have two different roles to play as a daughter or a, or a son and as a sibling. So the how you, how, what mass do you put keeps switching based on who you're relating to, right? and how they are treating to. And then around that comes a lot of expectations, a lot of uh, do's, a lot of don'ts, a lot of, uh, uh, lot of uh, expectations from yourself and expectation from others, right? So from your parents, uh, you can expect that, oh, my parents will take care of me, right? And my mom will give me milk and my mom will give me food and my dad will take care of me, protect me and guide me and uh, things like that, right? And, uh, uh, and then you feel safe, you start feeling secure in the company of the mother. Initially, the first few, few years when we are just born, like two, three years, up till first five years, when the mom is not around, you feel very edgy and we feel very upset. I mean, your parents are around, you feel very safe, right? And when your siblings are around, they are there, play with you, take care of you and have fun and things like that, right? But as you start growing and then you go meet more people to your neighbor kids and then you create more friends and your sense of experience will start changing, right? And the, so if you actually see now we are going one, one step deeper, not only the physical things, but now you're going into a little deeper aspect of how do you feel when you are with your parents? How do you feel when you're with your siblings? What, to, what feelings to expect, right? And those kind of things keeps coming in and out, right? and those keeps changing, right? And then as you start going through this journey of different interactions, different experiences, different relationships, when we say relationships, they are more than one-time experience, right? Like your relationship with your uh, siblings, what you experience with them is more than one-time relationship, right? You hold on to certain image of a person, you hold on to certain expectation, right? If uh, one of your sibling is very calm and quiet and then he, they, they are very much engrossed in their own thing and you didn't build too much expectations around them. And if you have an elder brother and then he's always taking you to the school, taking you to the grounds and, and, uh, and 
so the whole expectation, that whole relationship that you have built is throughout your interaction with that person, whatever you have experienced, and you slowly start creating an image of that person. And, and that image is based on how you're interacting with that person and how, what, what are the different events that happen or different experiences that you had interacting in different moments. And just imagine if there are certain, certain interactions which are very strong and certain interactions which are normal day to day, right? Eating, sleeping, playing, moving around. And just imagine there is a major incident like, uh, like maybe there is a separation of your parents and that one incident changes the whole quality of your childhood, right? And the love that you used to get from your mom and the protection that you're getting from your dad. And now you have to compartmentalize, right? Now they are all, they're not together anymore. So what you were experiencing before and what you're going to experience after their separation, the whole scene starts changing altogether, right? And your quality of your life slowly starts changing, right? And some incidents, may create a deeper sense of self, right? Like uh, if your parents have for, maybe maybe things didn't go well and they're really upset and they're they really going to a tough time and they might have treated you with a little stern eye and that experience might have created a little uh, dent on your identity, right? And how people treat you, you slowly start creating an opinion about yourself. And especially from first for the first five years of our, our stay in this body, we start absorbing whatever people say about us. People say like, oh, look, she's the beautiful one with a lot of beautiful eyes. And then you slowly start creating an identity of yourself. Yes, I'm beautiful because I have these beautiful eyes, right? And we slowly start creating our sense of self with our culture, right? Which are, so, and then you'll feel comfortable being among that settings or in that culture, right? I come from India uh, and then, uh, so you might be coming from the Western part of the world where culturally there may be little different difference in, in the festivals and the things that happen and, and the sequence of events that happen in an year, right? Different festivals, different interactions, different norms, different beliefs, right? So all of these things, we start getting comfortable with those things. And some other people coming from a different part of the world, they spend most of their time, most of their childhood time, especially, which really creates a sense of self, an identity of the self, uh, which creates a, a whole image of the self, that identity, who I am in the younger age, is all based on your childhood. So if two people growing up from two different cultures, when they start meeting together, so they'll come up with different belief systems, right? What is right, what is not right. Some things which, which is very uh, strong for you, which, which you can say that, no, it is, it, this kind of thing is not acceptable at all. And in the other part of the world, it's okay. If somebody do, it's not a big deal, right? So, so when two people come from totally two different belief systems, and then when they start interacting with one another, and they will start either becoming uncomfortable in the company of the others, or they may even get hurt by other people's presence because they come from a different belief system. And again, if you look into beliefs and values, values meaning what do you value, what you don't value, right? And it, there are two things that comes to my mind when, when, we, when it comes to the topic of valuing. Uh, when we start valuing things of, uh, of, uh, I mean, actually there are three things, material things, right? So one statement, one sister was telling 
we live in that culture now where we love our iPads, our iPhones, our car, our BMWs, our new house, right? And we use people. We use people to get to the things that we love, right? So in order to get to the things of your you love, you, you use people. In fact, it's supposed to be things are meant to be used and people are meant to be loved. And you may ask, like, why? If I like my iPad, what's wrong with it? If I like my iPhone or my gadget or Xbox, what's wrong with it? Right? And, uh, and in this material world, when especially when you use material, material is always there, we actually see. So especially when we say material world, we actually meant we are giving more value to materials than people. That is what we were actually referring to. So what created that? In other words, our, our experiences are coming more from the material things rather than from living things. People are alive. People are alive, meaning they're conscious, they have feelings, they are creative, right? So, they, so that is what brings uh, newness to the life. And um, another way of thinking is uh, people are exhausted, right? In other words, they want to have a predictable relationship. When we say relationship, what are relationship? Relationships are something where you expect certain kind of experiences, right? So when you want to build a relationship with something or some person, you are expecting certain experiences, certain uh, expectations of certain uh, experiences that you're expecting to come, expecting to have as you interact with that thing or a person. So especially when you see things are more predictable because they're not in, uh, they're very inanimate. So they're very programmed, right? So uh, when I say material, material can as well be your social Facebooks or Googles or YouTubes or any of those gadgets or Xbox or all those gadgets too. When you interact with that, what you experience is always predictable. And those gadgets are always evolving, especially to create that kind of experiences within you. Subconsciously, you create this opinion that these are more predictable. I trust these more. People are very erratic. So you have to be very, uh, uh, you, have to in, you have to invest a little more than, uh, uh, you have to put some energy into a relationship with human people, right? Subconsciously, if you actually say that is what's going on behind the scene. So when you start seeing, well, these gadgets are giving me more joy. I can, I can get on my motorbike, my 1000cc motorbike. I can ride around Highway 1. It feels really good. I can go out in the sun on the beach whenever I want. And if I don't feel like, I can just happily sit on my couch, watch some YouTube or Netflix or something. And uh, this is nice. I like to have this kind of... Uh, uh, expectation, uh, this kind of uh, guarantee, <laughs> you know, and, but if you look at the people, it's more risky <laughs> in a way, right? So you have to be, you never know how people behave, you never know what they're thinking and all of this stuff. So having said that, should we invest our time, our energy, life 
in all of this material thing? And if so, why not? This is something to think about. What do you think, Sarah? <laughs> Um, I think we need a little bit of both because if we're always being challenged mm. by building relationships with people, when you said people are unstable, it takes more work, that takes a lot. So sometimes it is nice to have something that it doesn't have to be an iPhone or whatever, but sometimes it is nice to take a moment to revisit something stable so that you can recharge your battery and then go back out to take those risks by forging relationships with other people. Mm. But why take risks? You said risk, you used the word. I know, I know, <laughs> it is definitely. But why to take risk at all? For potential reward? Oh, uh -huh. What is that reward? <laughs> I don't know, joy, love, laughter, knowledge. <laughs> yeah, so this is where the identity comes into picture, right? If you actually see at a deeper and long-term effects of where we are investing our time, especially in the material world, materialistic things, is that really making you happy, making you pleasant, making you content, right? <clears throat> and everything is, uh, uh, we can do this experiment on ourselves. So one of the experiment we can do is take a day when you are just sitting before your Facebook. Uh, and do you have any social accounts, Sarah? Uh, I have Instagram. Instagram, yeah, Instagram is good enough. Uh, it's a little more uh, provocative than uh, other Twitters and uh, Facebooks because it's all visual. Mm -hmm. you know? So out of all the senses, uh, visuals are more powerful. And Instagram is only visuals, right? So you'll be scrolling through the pictures and then they know what you like, what you don't like. And then they know what you like, what you like to see, right? And along with that, they sneak in some ads here, there, and then they sell you something. But when you, Instagram is nothing but bunch of photos, right? Pictures after pictures after pictures and different things, maybe some quotes, maybe this, that, and the other based on whatever uh, uh, whatever your uh, 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 visual behavior is, right? So they, they see the behavior, what time of the month, what time of the year you watch, what kind of pictures, what time of the picture, what time of the day you watch, what kind of pictures. They track your literally lifeline and they track your behavior throughout the lifeline, right? And then they start seeing the patterns within a week, within a day, within a year. And then they start reproducing the similar patterns with the different pictures, right? And that pattern is nothing but behavior, right? And when you see a certain behavior consistently coming up again and again, you feel comfortable. It's like, oh yeah, I'm in my comfort zone. <clears throat> this is my things, <laughs> you know? But in fact, just imagine you spend a good amount of time on your social accounts. After a while, what actually do you feel? Initially, you may feel a little, uh, rush like wow nice 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 and then after a while it starts triggering 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 and after a while if you can continue to do that you get exhausted mm -hmm. you feel mentally drained mm -hmm. that is a reality it instant gratification it will give it will give instant hype right it will spike up your uh, adrenaline it will spike up your uh, um, 
happy zone uh, and but that happy spike comes with a cost behind it right so every time you we keep engaging with all of these uh, triggers and uh, i generally use the word called triggered emotion right mm -hmm. in other words uh, um, you know if you carry um, car battery is kind of dead so you do a jump start jump start is coming from outside some other car or some other energy source you you put you, you get the jump start i see not run your car with keep jump jump starting mm -hmm. right it is just a trigger mm -hmm. the fuel has to be coming from within right but especially when we get into this materialistic uh, things as we start engaging with these things it triggers these different experience emotions within us and then that part of us is what we start identifying ourselves with mm -hmm. i see and then we say like i'm happy when i'm doing this that and the other right we use the word doing right i am happy when i am with this gadget or that gadget or this activity or that activity right or or watching this or watching that right or or it could be anything right so and then there is a sense of self that is created out of it but the truth is i'm more than that right and all that triggered sense of self came afterwards right but when you go back to your childhood days so what are the qualities that are very prominent and then we always uh, uh, refer to some of the signs of peace attributed to children right especially when children sleeping when they are sleeping you can see on the face they're very calm very mm -hmm. when they sleep their sleep is very deep and very sound when we say sound there is not much activity happening physically and also mentally right their mind is very calm and quiet and when you go into that deep silence you start uh, rejuvenating not only physically but also mentally you start rejuvenating right but as we start going further away from that uh, pure sense of self to the triggered sense of self and i'm just using this identity as triggered identity and when we hold on to that triggered identity right it 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 or uh, it does not help you to rejuvenate fully physically and mentally right do you ever feel exhausted mm -hmm. physically exhausted even after having a good long uh, sleep if you when you wake up you feel little exhausted mentally exhausted emotionally exhausted right so these terms physical mental emotional exhaustion you don't hear these terms coming from children right if they are physically exhausted they immediately go to sleep they do what needs to be done even on their uh, uh, dining table they are eating half way through the spoon they are gone right there is no stopping right and and then when they go they they when they come back they come back with a lot of energy right they just rejuvenate and then you rarely hear about this uh, mental exhaustion or emotional exhaustion from children right and other thing with children is they very much in the presence when when i'm using this word presence it is very much connected to the identity our sense of self is what sense of self now we have created two sense of self one is your true sense of self and other one is your triggered sense of self right so when you are in tune with your true sense of self and when you are in in whatever is happening around you 
you will be totally present to whatever is happening around you because you are not at risk in other words you are in that sense of self which will never change because it is what it is right and then from that place you are just co- coming out and connecting to whatever is happening around you right and if it is a triggered sense of self right say i like to be around these people and i have certain this belief system and that the expectation this that and the other and then there is there is this programmed self and from that place when i'm start engaging with whatever is happening around me so i'm trying to compare like is it matching with my my settings or not if it is not matching it is not compatible right and then you you won't even engage because it is not my thing right so you won't even be present there right and the and the place from where you will be coming and interacting with is totally from a different place which is not your original place right you are always putting on a mask and seeing through that lens of past seeing through that uh, lens of uh, uh acquired identity in other words what we call right so as long as i'm seeing that present scene with that acquired identity i'm not fully engaging with that scene so in other words i'm not taking full benefit of the presence because i'm not even present there that where i the real me i'm not even present there follow right so as we start going through this journey our more we spend time more we come from a, a acquired sense of self that sense of self starts growing bigger and bigger and bigger follow right so that i which we have created that i will start taking on its own journey and then we start investing most of our life life includes our time life includes our emotions life includes our thoughts our relationship right you are identifying yourself with that triggered self and that self takes on its own journey and it takes you along with it so then when the reality start hitting then what will happen and things will start coming into picture and what is the thing that comes to the picture the ultimate truth what is the ultimate truth ultimate truth is the death right but it will not just hit you only at the end but the whole universe is trying to guide you back to your truth to always brings tries to bring you back to the truth because the world wants to see you the original you not the created you right so the whole universe will start readjusting you pushing you back to your true self bringing your attention back to your true self right because that is the that is what you are best at because you are that but as long as i'm identifying myself with that acquired self now the stress starts building you are something originally and then you acquired some different identity for yourself at something else and now you're sitting in this acquired self and then the world is demanding your original self right and then there is a full stress that builds up and then there is a polarity that creates within ourselves right and the world also when when i say universe uh is um, it is like a course correction you know in the huge vast ocean when you are sailing through it nothing is out there it, it is just going with the wind then you'll go nowhere wherever the wind goes it starts blowing here there everywhere right if you set your course you say like oh from san francisco i want to go to honolulu 
to Hawaii somewhere, right? And you set your course and then you're going some, uh, heading towards west from San Francisco, you start sailing there. And as you start sailing, you check once in a month, once in few days, right? So then when you are, when you're heading one direction with small deviation of wind, this and other, you start, de this, uh, you, you start deviating from your path and you check after a week, you went way too off from your course. And then you have to redirect and then you start coming back from different place, right? And then you end up a lot of extra fuel, extra energy to come back to the path. And what if, if we try to do the course correction every couple of hours, right? Or every couple of minutes, keep recorrecting, recorrecting, readjusting. So then you're very much in track, even if there is a little wind you have to deviate or you have to uh, go around certain storms around, uh, you will be in a most optimal path, right? So in a way, life, the situation that is coming in our life is also like that. It will never hit you with a big, challenge all of a sudden there will be a lot of signs a lot of uh, signals uh, a lot of course corrections that will be coming our way but the sensor will just tell that you are deviating from your direction by one degree or two degree but if you don't act on it it will just keep giving you the signals right and after a point it will say that hey you're totally off your track and then there's a big alarm that goes off. And that is what catches your attention, right? But all throughout the journey, it is giving the signal that you're off the track, off the track, off the track, right? In the same way, even in our life, when we are going off our true identity of who we really are, when we are going off our true presence and coming back, coming from the whole acquired presence, the life starts giving us signals. And how does a life give us signals? You don't feel good. And that is a sign. It is just a signal. It is not that you're doomed to be unwell or ill forever. No, it is just a signal. Mm. So same thing in the body. Body, when there is a pain, pain is not your problem. Pain is the messenger. It's telling that something is not right in that place. Pain is trying to get attention of your attention. And, and more immediate your attention is needed, stronger is your pain. Follow, right? The intensity of the pain is directly connected to the attention needed. Mm -hmm. Same thing. If the pain becomes chronic, and if I'm not doing what it is needed. So then what will happen? The system itself will start breaking down. The, the system that's supposed to, to give you the signals itself will start breaking down, right? Uh, and then if you look at the body, body is re really uh, amazing gadget. It has this immunity, it has this cleansing system, it has this whole uh, medicine box, which is sitting within your body and all other things. But based on what you, you the one who is telling, uh, uh, you the one telling means like, where is your priorities? Based on that, your systems will start readjusting and realigning. One, one of that uh, example ways, uh, 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 last session, you might have heard about the fear, right? So the fear is what? Fear is another signal, right? Fear is not comfortable, but it is trying to get your attention in a way, right? So especially when you have a fear, what happens to your system uh, as a physical system, to your body? 
all of this your heartbeat goes faster right and especially any anything uh, your ang you become very anxious right you become very uh, edgy right all of these things are not your enemies right and then your adrenaline is pumped your whole body chemistry starts changing right so you are pumped with a lot of steroids in your body and who is producing your system is producing right and as your system is producing why is it producing it is preparing you for the unknown right fear is always about unknown right if there is an unknown your body is getting trying to prepare but your body does not know that is it a real threat or is it a perceived threat right real threat meaning is it a physical threat right your body is designed to take the commands right you the one who is thinking is giving a signal to your system telling that something is not right if you have a fear of a relationship right if somebody is uh, uh, somebody you, you love uh, are not behaving the way you, you are expecting them to behave and then you have the fear of uh, um, uh, of a ruptured relationship and that fear is more of a perceived fear but body does not know is it a real fear or is there a lion sitting next to you right but your body will prepare as if there is a lion sitting next to you it is pumping steroids into your body so that you can run physically run away from it or physically charge you with so much energy that you can go and fight back that threat physical threat but your body does not know about is it a physical threat or is it a perceived threat right but the system is designed but as it is preparing you to fight or flight where is it taking the energy out of it is taking the energy out of its vital uh, processes what is the vital process your digestive system preparing yourself protecting yourself with your immunity right all of this coronavirus is very much a big red flag to the whole of humanity telling that look you compromised your immune system mm -hmm. system is nothing but your defense mechanism from all of these viruses right mm -hmm. and why is this because there is people are constant stress stress again is this right your original self and your acquired self we start deviating way off from our truth right and this stress has built so much our attention is always on this triggered fear triggered emotions triggered experiences right and our true experience are at risk and in the process of being in a triggered state we are taking our whole of our life energy right including the physical energy away from what it is designed to do because if there is a lion sitting next to you would you like to think about what is where is your next meal going to come no you will think about like how do i survive the next moment right it is more of a survival mode that we we'll, we we'll, we'll start getting into right and that insecurity is what is driving the humanity right if you really see uh i mean this is something my dad always uh, pointed me out that the previous generation right uh they when they used to uh, take up a job they used to stick with one job for most of their lifetime right and here the average time a person sticks to a job especially in it is 2 to 3 years every 3 years make it uh, conservative like 5 years every 5 years somebody is jumping the job switching this job to that job right every time you are changing you are readjusting and of course it it is giving its own um, uh uh visible uh growth what we call right 
So the progress, what we are talking about. But uh, if you look at the whole humanity, how much progress have we made? We have went so far from our own abilities, right? This very corona is a, is a sign of that. It's not just one person or one set of people or one culture. No, it is the same all over humanity, right? So it all comes back to this very identity, right? So when we bring our attention back, and this is where meditation comes into picture, what is meditation? If you look at children, they're really happy, very pleasant, very much in the moment. When they, when they are smiling, when you look into their eyes, you can see that genuine love, the love which is not tainted with expectations. I'm talking about children around six months old or one year old, right? So there, there is no labels yet as associated with the, any interaction, right? They're not looking that, oh, is she going to give me a candy or a, or a toy, right? So when that labels have not yet created, when you look into the, when the child is smiling, they are expressing that pure present, pure joy. And that pure presence contains that pure love, that pure happiness, pure joy of being, alive, right? When they are alive, they, they express fully, they engage fully, right? They come from their true place, right? It is not only them, whoever is interacting with them, they also feel the same. They feel happy, they feel loved, right? It pulls them back to their truth. It invokes the truth within the other person also. And that is why children have so much power, right? Because of the being in their own element, they can get whatever they want, right? So physically, they're not that strong. They can't stand up on their own feet, right? So everything has to be done for them, right? Change the diapers, feed them, everything, shower them, everything somebody else has to do for them. Right? But still, whoever is doing, they're so happy to do whatever they're doing. Right? Because the joy that they're getting from them. Right? So why can't be like that throughout our life? And that is how life is supposed to be. Right? And that identity is what is lost. Right? So when we go back to the meditation, what we try to do is we, we are trying to go back to our true sense of self. That sense of self, which is not triggered, which is not, uh, 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 which, which, which does not come and fade off in and out kind of thing, which is what it is, what it is, right? And that is where, and this is not a, this is one of the most thought over question in our human existence. Who am I? Who is this me? And a lot of saints thought about it. A lot of uh, uh, scientists thought about this too. Who is that me, right? But scientists see with an eye of material uh, feedback, material validation. Whereas if you look at, uh, in India, within the saints, there are different categories, right? They call uh, um, sannyasis. They call, there are four categories just to put things into purpose, perspective. Sannyasis, munis, rishis. And within the rishis, there are four other rishis. Brahma rishi, Raj rishi, and there are other two categories. So if you actually see, Sannyasis, that is where it starts in, in the Eastern culture, how people start their journey uh, in this path. These are the people who sannyas means like they start saying, uh, it's more like a hermit. They start saying that I understand the nature of this physical relationships. When I eat this, I feel good. When I don't have, I, I don't feel good. 
So this is a triggered thing. I do what needs to be done to keep the body alive, but I don't want to take happiness out of it because this is not true. Right? They slowly start taking their mind out of all of these trigger things because they want to invest their time and energy on that which is real. So they start exploring by renunciate, renunciation, right? They slowly start having less interest in this material world. And slowly as this disinterest increasing, they open up their mind, they create some space. You know? If our whole of our day is spent thinking about this, thinking about job, keeping our bills and pills, uh, paying for all of this thing going on, you don't even have a time. Not only the time, but if you're thinking about all of these things, you get mentally exhausted. You don't even have an energy, mental energy to think about things like this, right? And same thing with your emotions. If you are get, keep triggered about all of these emotions, you don't even have a space. So you have to create space in your time, space in your mind, right? Uh, let go of those thoughts, which is not relevant for what you're actually looking for. Create some space in your heart to open up your heart, to experience something beyond all of this trigger triggered experiences. And that is how they start their journey. And those set of people, we generally call them as sannyasis. They renounce all of this uh, regular way of life, uh, material way of, way of life. They slowly start simplifying life, simplifying life. And then they say like, what is needed for our existence? All we need is like a, one plate of food, right? And I don't need a fancy food and all of this stuff. All I need is one plate of food. And, and then you just simplify, how do I get this? What is needed to survive the body? And you start looking for only basic things. You don't need to have a five bedroom house uh, with a huge garden and all of this stuff, right? All you need is a decent place to live, a shelter to live. You don't need 50 different pairs of shoes. All you need is a couple of pairs, right? One for your running, one for your in-house, something like that. You don't need 50 pairs of shoes, right? But same thing with your clothing, right? But how much time and energy do we invest or money do we invest in all of this fancy stuff, right? And in order to maintain that, how much more energy do we use? He keeps doing extra jobs and all other stuff. So in the process of simplification, more we start simplifying, more you start reclaiming, reclaiming your life, both in terms of time, both in terms of energy, more, both in terms of thoughts, both in terms of your emotions and experiences. And as you start creating space, right? Now, the next step, start coming. So the next step is more about, uh, next phase is what we call munis. Munis are those where they invest a lot of their time in the mind space, where we call uh, man is what we call the mind. Uh, in East, when we use man, uh, both head and heart are together. Man refers to both head and heart together. Right? So where is your head and heart? Right? So they invest their head and heart into this spiritual thinking. Right? They start focusing more. Those people are Munis. And now comes to the question, comes, comes the question like, how am I going to use this my mind time? Right? So they start focusing on let me observe that which is actually observing this is one of the one of the many tricks that they practice one of the many things that they practice munis being conscious of who is conscious most of the time we will be conscious of the trigger right 
for example, if you are watching Instagram, Instagram is a bunch of pictures. And where does your mind go? Your mind goes to what is that picture? What is it related to? Who posted it? And where it is coming from? Or maybe it is a, yeah, uh, Instagram is pumped with a lot of thought for the days, right? So your mind will start thinking about that, whatever trigger that is coming from outside, right? So instead, what Munis do is like, let me focus on the one who is focusing. Let me focus on the observer itself because that is me, right? So that takes a lot of silence, a lot of attention, a lot of focus. So as you start observing, it starts unveiling your, yourself. This true sense of self starts revealing to you with the gadget, with the tool that we will be using to recognize ourselves is our mind. Our mind, again, man, again, includes head and heart. Heart is the one which actually perceives, which actually feels, right? Say, if my mind, if my attention is on some picture, like uh, Instagram is pumping with some pictures of nature shots, right? So when you're observing the nature, what is your mind doing? Your mind is putting you in that place, right? And if you stay with that picture for a little longer, you start collecting all the details, the beautiful sunset or the rolling hills or the greenery. And, and as you start collecting all the details into your mind, your mind is recreating that scene in, inside your mind, right? When it recreates that scene within you, you start staying in that picture for a little longer, that picture will start converting into a feeling. And then your mind will start recreating how does it feel if you yourself are in that scene, right? And then you start trying to experience something, right? And this is what's happening in a slow motion. But most of the time it is triggered, triggered, triggered. And then we'll, before it, that total process completes, we immediately jump to the next picture, right? So as we start experiencing what we are trying to experience, we are trying to experience something which is created by the external thing. Whereas Munis, whereas one who is trying to meditate, what they try to do is they try to realize that, yes, this is mountains. Of course, mountains are there. There is sunrise, sunset. There is deserts. There is oceans. There are lush green forests like Amazons and all this stuff. Yes, this is all part of the nature, right? And this body is also part of the nature. But who am I? Right? So then they totally start taking their attention out of all of these things, including the nature, including these five elements, including the body, including the signals that is coming from the body, right? Including the chemistry that is giving the feedback to your mind, right? So when, once they start going beyond all of these things, it will start taking you into that space where the real consciousness starts coming alive, right? And this is why the silence is a big part of the meditation. Silence is a powerful practice that uh, reveals the true identity of the self. As you start getting re exposed to your true self, then you start recognizing that, wow, I have all of these powers. I have all of these capabilities, right? It's not only capabilities and powers. Then you slowly start realizing that what actually I was looking for in life, I'm experiencing that now. And that's exactly what happens with a newborn child. Because once they are in their own element, they're not seeking or some happiness from coming from outside, but they're very much in a place of love. And whatever they're interacting, they're just effortlessly expressing that what they really are. And it is effortless because it is what they are. If it is something that I have, I have to give away. So then I'll say like, I'm giving this, what am I going to get back, right? If you yourself is, you, if yourself are a being of love, then 
you selflessly love people. You selflessly express love to the people, right? And that there is no expectation because it is what you are. But to come to that place of awareness that I am a being of love, it takes this practice of recognizing who I am, not just as an idea or a concept that I am this conscious being, I am this eternal being, I am this being of peace, love, and happiness, right? Understanding is not enough. I need to get into that awareness. I need to get into my true presence, right? It, it cannot be another triggered uh, idea, right? Uh, one of the identity that we carry is the gender, for example, right? So if I'm identifying myself with the gender, it comes with a lot of uh, uh, its own uh, presets. If I identify myself with male, a man should behave like this. A man should not cry, right? Things like that, which is not true. But some tags will associate it with certain identities, right? So, but you can, if as long as I'm conscious of the self based on the costume which I'm wearing, uh, then I, my mind and my sense of self is stuck in that small shoes and it does not fit well. And then you struggle. You say that, no, I'm not weak, right? And then they say like, oh, no, women are like this. But you're not just a woman. You are more than a woman. You are the one who can think. You are the one who can feel. You are the one who can express. You are the one who can, you are very creative. There's a lot more to you than just a woman or a man, right? But I'm just giving one of the, uh, the false identities that we latch on to, right? And this is where, when we start meditating, we slowly start recognizing that I'm more than this. Let me try to experience that more, what I really am, right? So when I leave this body, this gender also goes away. But I stay. I, the one who is conscious, stays after I leave the body. With coronavirus, so many people are leaving. Unexpected deaths, right? Especially in India that is happening. No age bar, no culture, no no matter what they do, people are just boom, boom, boom. They don't know what is creating all of these things, right? So when we leave the body, we leave the gender, leave the roles that we play, leave, leave everything. Only thing that we move forward is who we really are, right? If we start getting to know ourselves sooner, so then we start getting the most of our life. Right? So this life, the purpose of our life is to experience the real thing. And, and not only experience, the, when we say a fulfilling life, we are talking about where every moment, there are no regrets. It's filled with pure peace, love, joy, and very much effortless because it is very natural for you. And when, when we really come to that state where we are effortlessly being in that state of love, happiness, and deeply rooted in that place of contentment. And that is when you feel so much more powerful than than ever, right? So when you come from that pure place and that stays forever, and as long as you're in that element, whoever is interacting with you, they get to feel all of that thing. So in the process, you start invoking that pure uh, sense of self in all other people. And that consciousness, that collective consciousness where everyone is in their own uniqueness, 
everyone is expressing their own unique beauty. Everyone is interacting. That creates a very beautiful world around us. And we came on this earth to experience that beauty, that diversity in the, in the humanity. But that has lost because everyone is lost touch with their truth, true identity, right? Starting with the self, right? If I want to fix the world in which I am living, I should start with myself. And this is why meditation comes into picture. And in meditation, this is what we try to do. We slowly start making space. And how are we making space? We start looking into where is it my energy is draining. So as I start going through all of these things, I slowly start reclaiming, reclaiming, reclaiming myself. And then slowly start moving away from that quiet identity to my true sense of self, that eternal being, that being of peace, love, and happiness. And then we start seeing there's a lot of things which are common amongst us. And recognizing is good enough, but we start living from that consciousness. The more we start living from that collective consciousness of we are this being, we are this one big family of love, right? And that love will naturally start flowing amongst, uh, between every, in every relationship, between every person on this earth. Not just humans, but also that thing is what is radiated further into whole of these five elements. And they respond to that. Right. So these are some of the thoughts which I wanted to share as uh, 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 we continue this journey of exploring the self. Um, anyone have any thoughts, questions, comments? Yeah. Brother, what yeah. is what does Rishi do then? Oh, Rishis are Rishis are yeah. those uh, they. They, they call, they call, I mean, one way of defining them are they are the scientists. They, especially if you look at, uh, there are different uh, uh, special specializations within rishis. There is Raja rishis, there is Brahma rishis. For example, Brahma rishis, they are known for having all the wisdom, right? So they acquire the wisdom based on exploring right so muni start experimenting with their mind they start going towards the uh, true nature of the self the nature of the world the nature of the uh, you know in 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 our course we learn about the three worlds right like physical world subtle world and the the, the soul world where which is beyond space and time right so how do i travel all of this thing right so I need to explore all of these things. These techniques, they are, ex they're, they're experts. They are, those rishis are, they, they have experimented with all of that things and they learn a lot of tools and they are, they are the, in a way, they call them as a wisdom keepers, right? Those are, those are Brahma rishis. Raja rishis are those, those who are very much uh, royal. Royal means they, they have, uh, they are self-sovereign, they have full control, they have the power of, of the spiritual power. And then there is Devarishis. Devarishis is, Dev means divinity. So they have this divine qualities. They are experts in expressing divinity in action, right? So the whole wisdom connected to that and the whole techniques, tools, and all of the stuff, all of the things comes alive. Right, and especially on the on this journey of uh, uh, Raj Yoga taught by Brahma Kumaris, this is where we start going much deeper into different facets of it. But definitely, it starts with simplifying life, right? Very much in tune with the nature, right? And then we start experiment, uh, clearing our mind, and then start investing our mind space and uh, heart, head and heart in a right direction, right? 
And as we start connecting our mind to that, that eternal truth, so then we start uh, uh, going deeper and experimenting in that mind space and in that spiritual space. And then you'll start becoming uh, experts in that spiritual path. Then you become Brahma Rishi and then Raja Rishi and then uh, Deva Rishis and all other stuff. So, and, but at least the direction is in this. Did I answer, Tim? Yeah, kind of, yeah. yeah. I'll see you in yeah. the future more. Definitely, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I need to go now, brother, sorry. I have to push sure. it on already, but it's too interested. <laughs> I stay in the moment. So, sure. Thank you for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So we should, uh, uh, if anyone have any other questions or comments, uh, uh, we'll do a little meditation and we'll go a little deeper, right? So Te Teju, would you like to share any of your thoughts, questions, comments, especially do you see uh, with respect to the course that you have done? Uh, I think this was very uh, enlightening. Um, and, um, you know, I think like for me, uh, I'm still pretty new to meditation. So I'm still trying to refine the way I do it. Like I sometimes get caught in the tools and the technicalities of doing it. But uh, like once or twice, I think I've, I've reached that stage of feeling the peace or, you know, like feeling refreshed. Uh, but I'm still, you know, like, I guess since I'm just starting out, I, I still need to continue it as a practice and then hopefully get there. But like, whatever you mentioned, like, it's so uh, true to our life today, you know, like with all the relationships and everything that's going on in the world, I think it's very important to sort of feel that peace within and realize your, your true self. So um, thank you so much for that wonderful, you know, like information that you gave us. And I'm, I'm just going to keep trying and hopefully, you know, become more, I guess, I, I don't know if good is the right word, but at meditating and feeling that inner peace within myself. Right. Yeah, it, it's, it's, a, it's a journey. And uh, in this journey, slowing down is going fast. Okay, that's good to know. Thank you. That does make so, sense. <laughs> that, so some of the thumb rules will definitely help us. Am I going in a right track or what are the things that uh, am I, one of the standard question that comes is like, uh, how do I know am I really meditating, right? Uh, am I doing right technique? Am I doing the right meditation or not, right? So, yeah, I have that question totally in my mind all the time. And I'm so stressed whether I'm doing it the right way that I guess I don't relax enough. So, <laughs> so here is the thumb rule. Like slowing down is going fast. Starting with your body. More you are relaxed, right? And pe some people say that, look, every time I meditate, I go into sleep. It's okay. Go into it. Go into deep sleep. Sleep. That is not meditation of sure, but sleeping will prepare you for the meditation. Once you have a good sleep and once you wake up and that is when you start your meditation, but don't resist the sleep. Follow, right? So once you are tired, mm -hmm. once you are exhausted, let body do what it needs to do. Go to sleep, sleep, relax. And then once you're deeply relaxed, you feel fresh. But that is not meditation. That is a beginning. That is a preparation for the meditation. And that is why in Raj Yoga, we always say, like, start your meditation first thing in the morning. If you wake up uh, at 6 o'clock, uh, try to push yourself at uh, 15 minutes before. Try to wake up at uh, 5.45 and take that 10 minutes, 15, 15 minutes for yourself where you're all with yourself your attention is not pulled to your tired body or, or exhausted mind. Your mind is fresh, your body is fresh, and then just sit for five minutes. I am state. 
beyond this physical identities and then start to realize, start to feel your presence. And that is what we call being conscious of your consciousness. And that is nothing but you, the being, you, the soul, you, the spirit, being conscious of that spirit within you. And it is not something else within you, but that, with, that something else is you itself. And that is uh, that gap, which is I have a spirit within me to I am the spirit to build that gap the silence come into picture and the self-awareness comes into picture. And that five minutes is good enough. If, if you ex, experiment to go into that conscious silence, you're consciously going into that silence where your attention is on that self, on the observer itself. And then you naturally start gravitating into it and you allow yourself to go into that naturally get gravitated to that spirit within you. And then you become that. Once you, you feel, even for a couple of seconds, I'm not even talking about whole minute, even if you can sense, have that feel of that I am this, you feel totally free from all of these labels. And that is what we call bodiless state, which is not, in other words, you're not, uh, you are free from all of these labels. And how does it feel to be you as that living being? That experience, even for a couple of seconds, will totally awaken a awake, uh, lot of uh, powers within you. And, and definitely that you start doing when your mind starts relaxing. It means your mind is not thinking or expecting anything. Your mind is calm and still. Your emotions are very free and open. You're just creating that space for that thing to happen. And then you naturally become who you really are. And that is the most beautiful place to be. And once you get into that place, now you know what it is. And from there, you try to be yourself for the rest of the day. And that gives you, it is as if you plugged into the source of the power and then that power keeps coming throughout uh, the day and throughout the day your attention is more on keeping that connection alive connection to your true self alive right and that's all sounds good Teja? yeah yeah it does thank you this was definitely really helpful i'm going to try it during my meditation thank you thank you kathy hope uh, this is uh, helpful. Feel free to unmute and share any thoughts, questions, comments. Okay, so we can take a couple of minutes to meditate. Yeah. Well, I'd like to say something about, uh, it was very good, Harsha. I, I liked how you kind of, uh, you, you started out with the polarity that you know, the experience of being stolen from your pure or true identity. Um, it's good to understand what that feels like. You know, how do we navigate to that sense of truth? And then we can experience when we deviate from that sense of, that true sense of who we are. And I loved how you kept coming back to um, the innocence of a child and we, didn't we all come into this world innocent? So I find that really sweet actually, that we already know what to do. We just have to get back to the child. Mm. And so, so in order to be this, and then you're referring to these masters, right? The Rishis and the Munis and these sages and also in Taoism, um, you know, these this ancient wisdom of understanding consciousness and to not be pulled into ego, you know, is a term that would be used in the Taoism. Um, and I, I, I'm 
actually quite intrigued, Harsha. I think this is, um, you know, uh, and we play many roles. And I think that's, as a child, the, what's the first thing they ask us when we're a child? What do you want to be when you grow up? Yeah. <laughs> It's already, it's set up for us to, to be, to deviate. It's set up for us to be, to fall away from our innate true nature, our true self. And it almost sounds cliche, you know, oh, I want to meditate and find my true self. Well, even that can be a role. Yeah, they true, yeah. You know, um, I'm not a white sari. I am not, and I am a soul. I am pure consciousness. I am, you know, but then, gosh, we've been trained to be somebody. And I almost wanted to ask you, how does one, when you, when you know the difference, you're going to feel it? Yeah. You're going to feel it and it's going to be from a spectrum of discomfort to excruciating identity crisis or even what they say, the dark night of the soul, right? So how, maybe, this is a question for you actually. How does one stand back in, in you have that discomfort or pain and um, not to um, want to, uh, you know, go into these uh, ways of distracting yourself, um, you know, to deter your attention, to numb the pain, um, uh, you know, um, what's, there's a term for that. Um, it's not distraction, it's, um, diversions mm. and they used and in the old days in old england humor the word they said oh didn't you find that funny well they would say weren't you diverted mm. like as if it took you from one reality and um took you out of the role play to just be yourself and laugh like a kid mm. anyway so again, my question would be, how does one know, one know the difference in, the, in that process? And it could be not just pain, it could just be that distraction, too many thoughts, you know, and what do I cling to in order to know who I really am? Mm. So I know that sounded a little confusing, there were a lot of no, images. no. It is clear. It is okay. Uh, yeah. So, so yesterday we had a beautiful uh, uh, sharing by Sister uh, Aditi. Uh, if you remember, uh, Sister Aditi is uh, one of the person who is from uh, our headquarters, Mount Abu. Uh, she was sharing her experience, and I was, uh, in a way, coming back to the similar question, asking her. So what she had is like uh, first time when she went to the meditation center, she had this deep experience of being bodiless. And uh, she felt bodiless. She experienced the presence of Baba and uh, that deep, that deep love. She experienced that, that, that deep sense of love, a deep sense of belonging. Mm -hmm. And uh, that experience becomes your reference point afterwards. Like, am I navigating in that direction? Or am I going away from it, right? <clears throat> what is in my way in that state of myself? And that is what become her North Star to guide herself towards that, right? And my question for her was like, look, not everyone has the kind of experience that you had. Like, and then she's, she said like, she had that, uh, I mean, actually, she had that because she acted on it, right? So she was sharing, there was an incident where she was at work and uh, she had to make a very critical decision either to comply to the work 
or comply to the need which is needed in the center where uh, her senior sister was telling her to go to all the villages uh, because everyone uh, who supposed to do are not there and uh, she has to go out and then read murli for all the all the different centers uh, in the in the village side and and she has a very critical role to play on that day at, at the work there was some auditing going on there was people it was very much dependent on her uh, the whole wh of funding was depending on on it and she had to make a very tough decision at that time and at that time she said like well what's what's the max i'm going to lose right and th this is where the debate that is going on inside her head like should i comply to this or should i comply to that like what is the max am i going to lose if i don't go to the work and then she was weighing out right and what am i complying to what am i uh, leaning towards is something based on this is coming from a pure place this is coming from a genuine place this is a person who is telling this is what is needed at this point of time and it was very clear direction that you have to go but it is not like can you go is it possible it is not that open question it is like you have to go right mm -hmm. and so so then it is very clear data points like should i comply to this or comply to that then she said like yes this is coming from a pure place and i have to comply to that and then she just followed through that and then throughout the day she was in the zone she was reading the murli she's embodying that she's going from that place of embodiment she's sharing and then she's going deeper and deeper and deeper throughout the day she was telling like she might have read the same murli almost like 10 to 15 times right and every time she is going she's going deeper into deeper into that that state of mind what the murli was creating and that, that's what she says, like her two powerful things is Murli and Swadarshan Chakra. And uh, for those, uh, this may be little uh, buzzwords <laughs> around. So, so, the, so these are the two tools. If you actually see the Dev Rishi, Dev Rishi is, the, the, is Krishna. Krishna's ornaments is the Murli is one thing. Another one is uh, the Swadarshan Chakra. So anyhow, so it goes back to what is this? What the chakra is nothing but being conscious of yourself, conscious of yourself. Go back to your true state of yourself. That mm -hmm. state of mind is what one thing. Another one is murli. Murli is that divine love that you are constantly soaking in. Right? It's different versions of love, in a way right? So it is activating different things. You keep soaking in these two things. Go back to your core, who you are, tune into that divine love, experience that divine love, right? So, she, and, and she said, like, after she went so deep into that state, that that state of bodilessness, it's not the same. I mean, once you get into that bodiless state, there are different variations again. <laughs> that is where Murli enriches that uh, that soul consciousness right that divinity comes com comes alive within that divinity there's so many variations within that right so murli is the one that enriches that soul consciousness so she was telling she went into such a deep state that she held on to that bodiless state for almost a couple of years together wow. she felt as if that this body is something which is stuck to me as if I'm wearing, as if I'm walking, walking by and then something get uh, stuck to your feet, you, you're just dragging along it. She felt as if this body is stuck to me. What is this thing? Right? I need to get off me. Right? And that is a state of awareness she was in. Right? So coming back to the question, like the the wide spectrum where we move from where we are to what we really are my personal uh, um, experience which helped me is make things pleasant your journey in other words as i simplify my life whatever i'm replacing with that pure presence enjoy that 
right? How am I going to simplify? As I simplify, I'm relaxing myself off whatever is stuck. So as I'm simplifying that space which I created by relaxing, relaxing means I'm letting go some of the uh, burden. That relief, try to enjoy that. Make your journey pleasant right from the first step you're taking. Don't make it uncomfortable thing. It cannot be sustained. Mm -hmm. And it cannot be sustained if you're forcing yourself to be something else or forcing yourself to be your original self also is a burden that cannot be sustained. That, that process will not work out. It, it, it is very counterproductive, right? Mm -hmm. So starting itself right from the beginning, relax and enjoy. More you feel good, you continue. That will catapult, that, that pulls you towards your true self. Make your journey pleasant right from the beginning. If you're letting go of something, don't. If you're feeling that, oh, I'm sacrificing something, I'm letting go of something, I'm losing something, I'm less of something, if that is the state of mind, it is not going to work out. So when I'm letting go of something, if you're focusing more on like, look, I'm more relieved, I'm more at ease, I'm mm -hmm. more comfortable where I am right now and try to focus on that sense of comfort, try to enjoy that comfort. More you're feeling that joy, that itself will take you a little further into that state of mind, further and further. And then you start refining that. And that which refines and sustains that stage is my sense of joy right from the beginning. It could be reclaiming my time from my day, uh, day's routine, or once I reclaim what am I doing with the time and how pleasant am I making that time, if it becomes pleasant, your mind will readjust the routine for your next day. Right, your priorities will change. It will, the and mind will change. figure it out. You don't have yeah. to think like, should I, how do I reprioritize? Your mind will figure it out, the solution for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, wow. Thank you, Harsha Bhai. Thank you. Brother Harsha, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so Harsha Bhai in Hindi means brother Harsha. Just learn, a, you're learning some Hindi this evening. It's good. So thank you so much. It was very thank rich you. and full. We will be um, putting this class on YouTube so you can enjoy it or share it with others. So do you wanna close with a meditation, I guess? Yeah, I was thinking to have a little short meditation. Let's see. Uh, so let's, uh, Sarah, you have any questions, comments? No, thank you. Cool. That was amazing. Thank you. So let's take for the next uh, few minutes, tell yourself that you're just going to relax. Wherever you are, make yourself very comfortable with your ambience. Listen to all the sounds, all the sides. Feel the ground beneath your feet or the floor on which you are sitting. Make yourself very comfortable wherever you are. Sit straight, make your body comfortable by allowing the energy to naturally flow to different parts of your body. Straight spine, shoulders next to your hips, hands on your feet, and gently turn your palms towards the ceiling And gently bring your attention to your breath. Bringing the attention of your mind to yourself, the body.
focus on your breath. Feel that fresh oxygen, that soothing, life-giving energy flowing along your nostril. Flowing through your throat, filling your lungs. Each breath, feel that fresh energy filling your lungs, flowing into your heart. Relax all the muscles around your heart. Inhale deeply into your belly. Feel this energy flowing into different corners of your body. Each breath. making your body more pleasant. Relax. Your shoulders, your arms, your elbows. Feel. Feel the energy flowing through your body. Relax. Every muscle in your thighs, your knees, your shin, your ankles, your heels, all the way to the tips of your toes. Feel the energy. Whole of your body is soaking in this energy. Fresh, calming energy. Each breath like a fountain. Flowing into your brain. Relax all the muscles around your scalp. Your temples. your forehead, your eyes, your cheeks. Let this calming energy radiate from your face. Each breath, a breath of calmness flowing into your brain. Feel the subtle movements in your brain. Let the energy flow. Relax. Observe the space behind your forehead. a peaceful space, the mind. Relax your mind, free your mind of any thoughts. Let your mind be filled with this peaceful presence. Peaceful mind. Calm and clear mind. A spacious mind. Feel the presence, 
peaceful presence. Allow this sense of pleasantness to seep into your heart. Very loving presence. Allow the sense of contentment to grow in your heart. Just allow. Spend some time with yourself, that pure presence. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Peace within your presence, peace in your mind, peace around you. Go into that connected presence, that peaceful stillness. Om Shanti. Thank you very much for your loving presence. So we'd love to see you again on our next Tuesday talk. Om Shanti. Good. Om Shanti. Om Shanti. Thank you.